I would like to welcome to the YTH stage one of your leaders, Mr. Stephen Bartels, is going to bring it tonight. Thanks, Steve. Let's go. So, yeah, I'm the other Steve. I am the shorter and older, that's for sure. Steve, I'm also the one without the really cool mustache. I can't pull that off. Also, my wife would probably divorce me. So, funny story, I actually grew one just like his. In 2006, I was deployed, so I wasn't near her, so it was okay. But I made the mistake of getting on a video chat with her right before coming home. Her words exactly. If you come home with that, you may as well check yourself into a hotel. So it was shaved before I showed up. So, so yeah, I appreciate the mustache. It's, it's, it's pretty epic. All right, so today is the... This doesn't stay up. That's awful. So I like to lean on things, but I am older. Today is the power of the invite is what we're gonna talk about, all right? So many of you here were probably invited at some point in time, if not to youth, maybe to church, maybe your family was invited to church. Somehow you got here, True. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah head nods, yeah. yeah. Everyone pretty much invited somehow, some way, or you've invited people. Yep. There may be people in here that you've invited, good job, keep doing it, all right? So what I'm gonna to do today is tell you kind of a story that's very personal to me, and it's about my grandfather and the power of the invite, and how God can use the power of the invite to bring someone, and you'll see, okay? So, Connor, if you could go to the first picture. Aww. All right, so that is my grandfather on the left, and that is his three sons, so my father, my two uncles, and my grandmother, okay? That was probably early 60s. All right, next picture. Even cuter, that's me on the left. Yeah, that's my brother in the middle, my sister, that's my dad in the top left, and my grandfather on the right. All right, next photo, this is my favorite. So for the fishermen and fisherwomen in the house, this was the first fish I ever caught from beginning to end. I baited the hook, I cast the line, hooked it, reeled it in, pulled it in, pulled the hook out. That was my fish. Wow. Awesome, right? I'm also allergic to fish, so when we tried to eat it, I threw it all up. It's terrible. <laughs> this is my favorite photo of my childhood. It just is. It's just one of the coolest photos. I, it, it's on my Facebook. It shows up every once in a while. I love seeing it, and my, my parents love seeing it, too. All right, those three photos I show you because what you saw from my grand, grandfather, you saw a guy that was probably smiling, family man, with his grandkids, his sons, right? What you didn't see is the hurt that was inside him, okay? So a lot of you probably had relatives that were, you know, in the military at some point in time, World War II, specifically. Maybe grandfathers, great-grandfathers. I did too. My grandfather was in World War II. Unfortunately, he's German. So he was on the other side. No, it's okay, you, you choke, you good? Okay, wanna make sure. So he, he was on the opposite side. Now that, that would be enough to be a story into itself. But what I found out later about my grandfather is that he wasn't just some draftee in the regular German army. It wasn't until he passed that I found out from his great niece that actually he volunteered. He was actually part of Hitler Youth. If you don't know what that is, look it up. He then volunteered to be part of the worst of the worst in the Nazi army. He was going to be an SS troop. So if you know anything about the Holocaust, you know that the SS troops were the ones that were committing the, the horrible, horrible actions within the cities, dragging people from their homes, doing executions on the street. And that's what my grandfather was volunteering to do. And he was in training to do it when he was captured. I thank God he was captured. I'm sure he didn't. But he was sent to a prison camp in Poland. Now that's, that's important to know because regular German army folks, when they got captured and were POWs, they were sent to Texas. That's why there's a ton of Texas towns that are German, because they opted not to go back. So amazing towns that we love to go to, like Fredericksburg. Right? Those are towns that Germans just decided to stay and settle. My grandfather went to Poland. And why? Because he had the SS on his uniform. 
They kept the worst of the worst in Europe. He was there for a year in prison. He ate grass to survive. He became emaciated. And one day he finally escaped. Started making his way back to Germany. The war ended while he was on the run. And he was able to get back, get to his wife. They had my uncle. But then he realized after about two years, Germany wasn't going to be a place for him. He couldn't do it, couldn't make it. He needed to leave. So he grew up in Argentina, actually. His father helped build factories, helped manage factories in Argentina when he was a young boy. So he decided, that's what I'm going to go do. So he took his family and went to Argentina. It's where my father was born. It's where they made a good life. And eventually, through the graces of his sister, who married a, a army private, was able to get a visa to come to the United States. Now, he lived in Massachusetts. He was a hardworking person, very stubborn, but very good with his hands. Right, His hands were basically callous all the time. He struggled a bit because he didn't know the language, but he, he forced himself to learn. He forced himself to, you know, ingrain himself in the culture. He forced himself to be part of the community. He was able to make enough money to get a loan and buy a motel right on the outskirts of Cape Cod before the Kennedys made it famous. So, which was great because he got to catch the windfall of all that. So he actually made a pretty good life for himself. Now, one of the problems was he was so used to working with his hands that when it got to a point where he couldn't do that, he was having trouble. So he bought a house in Florida thinking he could be part of a community that was more his age because Cape Cod was getting overrun by hippies and, and people trying to go on vacation. So he bought a house in a 65 and older community. And he was there for a couple of years and he would participate, participate in things like the Oktoberfest, of course, make food, everyone loved it. But one night, he had too much to drink. He was always someone that drank a beer pretty much every day. I always knew him drinking a beer. Actually, my first beer was stealing it from him and downing it. Uh, it doesn't taste good when you're six. Uh, but he had too much to drink. And the story I heard was that he he raised hands to my step-grandmother. He spent two nights in jail. Hard enough, right? As a, I think he was 67 at the time. Two nights in jail. But when he came home, one amazing thing happened that I didn't learn until later on in life, until I was at his memorial. A pastor showed up at his house. That community was so tight-knit, they pretty much all attended one church, and they had one pastor. This pastor showed up because someone in the community was hurting, and he wanted to sit with him. Didn't want to preach to him. Didn't want to try to, you know, convert him, do anything like that. What he wanted was to find out what was wrong. And he found out that my grandfather was losing purpose. He wasn't able to work with his hands anymore. He wasn't able to do the things that he used to do. And so the pastor came up with a brilliant idea. Because they loved his cooking so much, because the man could peel an apple with one hand. I've never seen anyone in my life do it other than my grandfather. He could hold an apple and a paring knife in one hand, spin it, and peel it in one go. That's how, that's how big his hands were and how, how amazing he was when it came to cooking. And it was awesome. He could cook any German dish you wanted and probably cook it better than you ever had. And that's what the pastor wanted. He wanted to have my grandfather take care of some people in the community. So he invited him to be part of the give back to the community community group. So he was part of the community group without belonging to the church because he knew my grandfather wasn't going to say yes to that because they've tried. So they had him bringing food three or four times a week to folks that couldn't cook for themselves. They just couldn't. They were either sick, too old, confused, or they just couldn't cook. <laughs> Either way, he was bringing food. Now, what my grandfather didn't know, and the pastor let us know, is that he told every person, every family that my grandfather was going to go to, 
when he shows up, I want you to pray over him and pray in front of him. And if you feel compelled, invite him. So they did. Three or four times a week, my grandfather made food for someone. They prayed over him. They prayed over the food. And most times they invited him to church. And he said no every time for 10 years. He said no for 10 years, three or four times a week, every week. And it wasn't until his neighbor, his neighbor, dear friends of his, the husband started falling ill with heart issues. So he started taking care of the neighbors more and more. So every day he was cooking them meals on top of cooking the meals for everyone else in the community that he was supposed to be doing it for. One day the husband died, and it was just the widow. She was 90 years old, suffering from late-stage Parkinson's. She couldn't stand up on her own. She couldn't do anything on her own. She had a live-in nurse. And my grandfather cooked all three meals for her every single day. And one day, this 90-year-old woman decided to ask my grandfather if he could just drive her to church, because she hadn't been in a while. Leave her in the parking lot. Someone will get her and bring her inside. That's all she wanted, and that he could come back in an hour, pick her up, and take her home. He, of course, said yes, and he brought her. But when he got to the parking lot, he couldn't bring himself to leave her. So he took her inside, sat her down near the front row, and then he decided to sit a few rows back. That lasted for a few weeks, according to the pastor. But a few weeks, he was sitting next to her. And a few weeks after that, he was singing worship. A few weeks after that, they caught him opening the Bible and trying to find the scripture they were using. A few weeks after that, he reached out to the pastor and wanted to ask questions after service. And then a few weeks after that, he gave his life. The 90-year-old woman didn't, didn't live very much longer after that. My grandfather only lived a year after that. And like I said in the beginning, I didn't know this until I was sitting at his memorial. And I cried because of it. Because I knew when I stepped away from contact with him, because my parents had told me, he's, he's losing it, he's drinking, he's not a good influence, don't bring your kids around him. And I didn't for 10 years. I was so happy to hear that a 90-year-old woman broke my grandfather. A 90-year-old woman broke my grandfather. Broke, broke this stubborn, German, hard-working man. Broke him. She invited him. Now, she only invited him to the parking lot. But that's all he needed. Because he was invited for 10 years. Four times a week for 10 years. And each time he said no, it was a little chip of the armor coming off. That's right. That's right. And all that took was to expose that enough to when he got to that parking lot, God did the rest. Right. And God got him in the building. Wow. Mm -hmm. yep. He was invited by so many people. I don't even know how many people invited him and he said no to. I don't even know how many of those people never got to hear the story later on. Because they passed away before he finally said yes. But they see him now. They see him now, yeah. right? Every no was important to my grandfather because it was, it was breaking him down slowly but surely, taking this hard, stubborn man and breaking him down to where he finally said yes. And he finally went in the door. And God did the rest. God did the rest. The woman just needed to get him there. And God did the rest. Now, we want to use Scripture for everything that we bring message-wise, so go ahead and show the scripture. So I, I go to 1 Corinthians, so this is Paul writing to Corinth, the church in Corinth, and I, I use this, if you read it, uh, good, I'm out of the way. If you read it, I won't read the whole thing, but if you look at what it says, it's basically saying God can use the weak to take down the strong. God can use the fool to take down the wise. God can use 
a weakness as a strength to break someone. So what's your weakness that God can use as a strength? 90-year-old woman with Parkinson's. I can only imagine how frail she was. I never got to meet her. I will one day. Amazing. A 90-year-old, I never would have expected that. Knowing my grandfather, I never would have expected that's what happened. That that was his story after I cut off contact. That that's what happened. Just because people decided to invite him over and over, and they never gave up. They never gave up. They never stopped inviting him. And finally, God used the weakest in that community to break one of the most stubborn. If you pull up the next scripture, you guys remember the story of the Pharisees trying to trick Jesus, right? It's often used in many messages. right? They tried to get him to say, you know, or to trip him up, because what was the most important commandment, you know, in Deuteronomy, you know, the laws of, law of Moses, what was, what was the most important commandment? What did he say? Before I even pull up the next slide. Good. What did he say? He said, did it come up? Oh, man. <laughs> you went too fast. But it basically was, love God first. The second, and equally as important, love thy neighbor. Right? That pastor had the wisdom to know that my grandfather needed to love his neighbor first right. before yeah. he could ever learn to love God. Yeah. Yeah. He needed to belong before he could believe. Yeah. And he was hurting for that belonging. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what that pastor gave him. Yeah. And, I, and I got to hug that pastor and cry with that pastor at the memorial because what an amazing t- testimony to God. Mm-hmm. Like, had the faith to go to a man that hit his wife two nights before, and instead of turning his back on him, welcomed him in and said, I'm going to give you purpose. And then when purpose wasn't enough, God finally was able to break through and get my grandfather to believe. And I know I'm going to get to meet my grandfather in heaven, and he's going to be able to explain the story in more detail. And I can't wait. And I can't wait to hug the 90-year-old woman You know, with all that pain gone from her life. I can't wait to meet her and know that she probably said a prayer kind of like this when she got to the parking lot. She probably said a silent prayer. Please, Lord, I got him here. Get him the rest of the way. That is probably the prayer she said. And I want to ask her that because I bet you my my life savings, that's what she said in her head. And she she did it. 90-year-old woman. Amazing. Now, it doesn't end there, right? So, I met with Tim, if you pull up the next picture. So, this is the Navarre Bakery and Creamery. If you haven't been there, go. It's amazing. Uh, it's on the east side of Navarre. It's right at the Santa, Santa Rosa County, Okaloosa County line. This is me and Tim last Friday. We went there to discuss today's message. I wanted to make sure that I was on point, that I was saying the right things, that I was talking about the right thing, that the story was appropriate and that I had the right scripture. When you show up for God, God's going to show out. So we showed up that day for God to talk about a message, and God showed out. And here's how. Go to the next. So it talks about in Luke 14.23 of beating the hedges, finding behind, going behind the hedges and inviting. Right? This is to a, a grand feast, but it's used as a parable for inviting to church. Invite when you can. Go out and find and invite. Go to the next picture. This is Brian and Kelly. They own the bakery. We went there thinking we were just going to talk about a message. And when we showed up, Tim, in his usual way, said, no, I'm paying. And if you say it first and in the South, you win and you get to do it. So he held out his card and he went to pay. Now it's a chip reader and it's an RFID and neither worked which they said was unusual, but Kelly said, no problem, I'll just enter it manually. Because she had to enter it manually, she saw that it said Momentum Church on there. Had she not done that, she wouldn't have seen that, and the conversation wouldn't have gone like this. Oh my Lord, I've been wanting to try Momentum. 
To which I then responded, well, you're in luck. This is the pastor. <laughs> to then, they said, we have been looking for a church since we moved here in the summer. And of course, the next obvious question is, where did you move from? And this is how Tim got new best friends that can make really good, yummy treats. <laughs> we moved here from Knoxville. <laughs> of course, the next obvious question that Tim asks, are you Vols fans? And they just point at the little mint holder that they had that has the blue tick hound from, from the volunteers holding up the mint, uh, the mint holder. And of course, now they're best friends, right? Because now they're Vols fans. But we got to talk to this family and invite them to Momentum. And they came Sunday. That's right. And they will be back continually because when I showed up to Gulf Breeze Theater, which is where we told them to go, no kidding, I pulled into the parking lot right behind them. I didn't time it. it seemed like I was stalking them. But I pulled in right behind them and got out. And that was amazing because I was able to take them, walk them in, make sure Tim saw them, Stephanie, Denny, Georgie, Christina got to meet them, Kevin got to meet them, a whole bunch of people got to meet them and welcome them in to Momentum Life Family, which is what they were looking for. Moving isn't easy, and, and people just see them as the bakers. But we were there to talk about a message about inviting, sharing my grandfather's story. I hadn't yet told it yet, and that story just impacted a family. Before I even told it, I got to impact a family with that story because we were there to talk about it. And I got to invite a family and make sure they showed up. So good. Yeah. What's amazing is I always go back to that 90-year-old woman and think about how she had the, the nerve to do what she did. Right? Some people will say she tricked him to get to the parking lot, right? Cross thinks so. <laughs> but she didn't. She honestly gave him an out. She said, you can leave me. She honestly needed a ride. She couldn't drive herself. She, could barely, she couldn't stand. But she knew that if she just got him close enough, God would do the rest. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Amen. God qualified her. As frail as she was, she saved one last soul before she went. And I'm so thankful for that woman. And I can't wait to meet her. Who do you have in your life that you need to invite? Whether it's to youth, whether it's to church, whether it's to community. Maybe they don't need church yet. Maybe you know they're not there yet but you need them to help. You need them to understand that belonging is okay first. Helping them love thy neighbor, and then they can believe, and then you can start working on that. Who do you have in your life that needs that? I'm sure someone has someone. In here, I know there's people that are inviting fiends, and they invite all the time. Xander's one of them. And right. that boy invites constantly. Yep. And I know, that's right. That's right. But I know there's others. I know other people invite constantly. And you may get a no. You can make it a no for years. It took 10 years. 10 years before my grandfather just said yes to go to a parking lot. And God did the rest. All right. So we don't like to end gatherings, whether it's at Blackwater, at Gulf Breeze, Pensacola, Navarre, or here at Youth without giving everyone a chance to cross that line of faith. Okay? I'm going to lead you guys in a sinner's prayer. We're all going to have heads down, eyes closed. You don't have to do it yet. <laughs> I see you, even though the lights are blinding. When we're done, after we say it out loud, so that no one feels singled out. If you feel like in your heart you are accepting Jesus today, we want to know. Not to embarrass you, but so that we can make sure that you know you're not alone. That's right. 
So when I'm done, everyone's going to keep their heads down and eyes closed. And I'm just going to ask you, if you said it for the first time and, and you want that relationship, just lift your head and make eye contact with me so that you know you're not alone. Okay? Heads down, eyes closed. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior. I know you can use my weakness as strength. I now give you my life. I receive your life. Now teach me how to live. In Jesus' name, amen. And keep your heads down and eyes closed. On the count of three, if you said that for the first time, I want you to raise your, raise your head and make eye contact with me. One, two, three. Okay, heads up, guys. All right, next, we've got Chase, who's going to give us the announcements. Yeah, Chase!